All right. There we go. All right, Chemistry 3101. We left off last lecture. We were talking about hydrogenation, catalytic hydrogenation, and now we're going to move on with um, our addition reactions to alkenes. And where we're going to start today is with halogenation. And halogenation obviously involves a halogen. And it says here the definition of halogenation, very simple, is that halogenation is simply the addition of two halogens across a carbon-carbon double bond. So if we take an alkene, just the simplest possible alkene in the universe, which is ethylene, and you can call it ethylene or you can call it ethene, but we usually call it ethylene. You, if you add chlorine to that, so chlorine is a gas at room temperature, but if you just add chlorine to that, what you get is one chlorine gets added to each of the carbons that was in the double bond. And what's cool about halogenation is that we all take advantage of PVC pipes, polyvinyl chloride pipes, um, you know, because of plumbing. And I'm sure that you all live in some kind of residence where you have plumbing. So halogenation is actually one of the key steps in the production of uh, PVC. What they do is they take ethylene, which of course comes from the petroleum industry, they chlorinate it, and they do an elimination to make this little molecule, vinyl chloride, and then they do a polymerization reaction in order to make polyvinyl chloride. And in um, organic chemistry too, we actually do a whole chapter. It's probably the shortest chapter in the entire textbook, but it deals with uh, polymers and polymerization. And so we would talk about that at the very end of organic chemistry too. Something to think about there. Anyhow, something else that's interesting about halogenation is you're only going to see us do halogenation with chlorine or bromine, right? These are diatomic elements. You should know the diatomic elements. Sometimes people remember them as Brinkelhoff, and anyhow, my students have all kinds of ways of memorizing those. But the reason that we can only use chlorine and bromine is because if you try to do it with iodine, it, the reaction is so slow that it doesn't work well. And if you try to do it with fluorine, well, that's when you're in danger of getting things like explosions, right? And we generally frown upon things like explosions in organic chemistry. We don't want to blow stuff up. And as far as the explanation for this, right, why is fluorination so violent? Why is iodination so slow? But why are chlorination and bromination so great? We'll talk about that even more in Chapter 10. But anyhow, right for today, all you have to be concerned with is chlorination and bromination. Now, with respect to the regioselectivity, check this out. Halogenation always occurs with anti-addition. Hey, what is anti-addition? It means that one of the halogens will add to one face of the molecule and the other halogen will add to the opposite face of the molecule. So in this case, if we were to start with a molecule like cyclopentene, we would end up with a pair of enantiomers, right? These are enantiomers. And I know you're all, you know, rock solid on your chapter five, your stereochemistry. So you recognize that you flip this stereocenter and you flip this stereocenter. So of course you have a pair of enantiomers here. But again, you need to know that halogenation occurs with anti-addition. One bromine going up, one bromine coming down. Well, there's a good explanation as to why halogenation occurs with anti-addition. This is actually one of my favorite mechanisms in all of organic chemistry. Probably my favorite one in chemistry 3101 is the halogenation mechanism. It's not a long mechanism, but it's such a it's such a great way or it explains so plainly why we get anti-addition. And it's because we form this really interesting intermediate, which you've never seen probably until today, uh, which is called a bromonium ion. So check this out. What happens is that you have your Br2 molecule. I'll write it in, in black ink here. So we have our bromonium molecule. Now, you think of this as being a, um, a nonpolar molecule, right? You think of Br2, why would it have a dipole? But what happens is, remember that elements or atoms and molecules are polarizable, which means that, you know, the electron cloud can distort. So what happens is that when the bromine molecule approaches the double bond, right, since there's high electron density in that double bond, right, since you have extra electrons in the pi bond or more electrons than you would in a sigma bond, what it does is it repels the electron, so you polarize the bromine and you render one of the bromines partially positive and the other bromine partially negative. Now, I'm never going to ask you to write me an essay about that, okay, and that's never going to happen, but um, 
the whole idea is that you get a nucleophilic attack by the pi bond onto the bromine. Now, what also happens is you lose bromide as a leaving group. And this is the part that's not even described here, is that one of the lone pairs on that bromine that is undergoing the nucleophilic attack, it's going to dump electron density into the other carbon. So you end up with this guy right here, which is the bromonium ion. Now, in order to make the bromonium ion, since it's a three-membered ring, right? You see how you've got the two carbons here. Obviously, there's hydrogens attached to them too, but you've got the two carbons and you've got the bromine. It's a three-membered ring. It's a small ring, right? It's going to be really tight. And so it's going to be pointing up on one face of the molecule like that. You could also have, you could have the, on the opposite face, but either way, there's no stereocenter here, but you get my drift, okay? But once you form that bromonium ion, then you have the bromide left over as a nucleophile. Well, the problem is that the bromonium, if I draw another bromonium, or if I, sorry, if I draw another bromine here, bromine cannot attack from this face, okay? It cannot happen. Why? Because this face of the molecule is so sterically hindered by that bromine with the positive charge. But the bromide can attack from the opposite face because it's just a lot less sterically hindered. You don't have that big positively charged bromine in the way. And that is why we get anti-addition. Because after you draw this loss of leaving group and this nucleophilic attack, and you draw the product, what you're going to end up with is one bromine is going to be on one face of the molecule and the other bromine will be on the other face of the molecule. So here's the entire mechanism. I want you to know this mechanism, okay? Put the yellow star. You need to know this mechanism. So again, the bromonium ion, once it's formed, the bromide, it's going to attack from the opposite face of the molecule, right? And you could write here, hindered, hindered face, okay, where the bromine is uh, in the bromonium ion, and then unhindered face, okay? And the bromide is going to attack at the unhindered face. That's it. So then you get one going up and one pointing down, and there you go, anti-addition. And of course, you're also going to produce the enantiomer, the non-superimposable mirror image. There you go. So that's the mechanism. Again, it's not, like I said, it's one of my favorite mechanisms. It's not a long mechanism, but it's a really cool mechanism. And really, I find that as long as students kind of memorize these arrows, which will start to come, become natural as you practice them, you know, usually once you show students the bromonium ion, they usually get the whole, well, if this is going to do a nucleophilic attack here, I mean, I always think of this as like a jack-in-the-box. It is spring-loaded. It is ready to open up, right? The bromine has a positive charge. I mean, does bromine want to have a positive charge? No, it wants a pair of electrons. It's like, give me those electrons from that sigma bond, right? So it kind of pops open like a jack-in-the-box, if you will. Anyhow, what's cool about this is that the halogenation is stereospecific. Right. What does that mean? If you remember, we talked about stereoselective versus stereospecific in chapter eight. Do you remember stereoselective? So that's not the topic of this slide. But stereoselective meant that you'd get one product in a higher yield than another because it was more selective. Right. Whereas stereospecific, what that means is you're going to get one product. Right. And it is defined by the stereochemistry of your starting material. Let me show you what I mean. If you start out with a cis alkene like cis two butene. Right, you get one bromine coming up, one bromine going down. Well, you'd get a pair of enantiomers in this case. Whereas if you start with trans two butene, check this out. You end up with one bromine going up and one bromine going down. And look, the carbons are in the same orientation as they were in your trans two butene. But check this out. If you rotate this sigma bond, you end up proving that you end up with this is actually a meso compound. Now, this is. A little bit annoying at first for organic chemistry students because if you remember when I taught you about meso compounds, I never would have drawn, or maybe in the practice problems, but I never drew a meso compound like that. I always drew it like this so that you could see the plane of symmetry, but I want to give you a heads up, okay? Our book is replete with questions about the stereospecificity of halogenation and what we're going to see later on today, dihydroxylation. So he wants you to draw the connection. He really asks a lot of questions about it um, between whether you're starting it with a cis or trans alkene and you understanding what the products are going to be if you have uh, sin or um, uh, anti-addition. So, of course, here we're talking about anti-addition. 
But again, it's not really evident here when you're first starting out like, oh, that looks like a meso compound to me until you rotate the bond and you see that plane of symmetry down the molecule like that. So something kind of interesting. And with all that information about halogenation, that's the whole kit and caboodle, really, so to speak. There, let's take a look at some practice problems. Okay, so we're starting out with this compound. We've got a beautiful alkene right here. I mean, if you want to, you know, write the carbons in or something like that, sometimes students like to do that just to remember, you know, those are the carbons where I'm going to add the bromines. Well, I'm going to delete those and I'm going to draw one of the products. Okay, so I'll just draw my carbon skeleton. And I know that one of the bromines is going to be pointing up. Okay, and the other bromine would be pointing down. So I'm going to draw on a dash like that. Okay, now. I, I know that probably most of you realize this is not a stereo center, so I didn't need to draw that on a dash, but I digress. Let's let's move on and let's draw the enantiomer. So we're going to have the enantiomer where I have what? Well, sorry, where I have um, one of the bromines going down. So this bromine is going to be going down, and that this bromine would be going up like this. So what I was saying is that since there is a CH2, right? This is a methylene CH2, CH2. That tells me that that carbon that I have highlighted in black on both of these, that's not a stereo center. So I don't have to draw those with dashes or wedges. I have students who do this on handwritten quizzes all the time. I usually don't take points off for something like that because they understand the idea. They're even trying to prove it to me that it's anti-addition, right? That's what they're trying to show me. However, and I didn't check the solutions manual on this, but I would imagine that in the solutions manual, he just writes this, okay? since that methylene is not a stereo center and then we could delete this as well and then we would write that and represent that that's not a stereo center too okay again if you were to write a dash in a wedge you know a dash here and a wedge there it's not the end of the world okay it's just again prove it proving to the reader really that you understand you know what the heck is going on well i have a question for you guys i know it's early on a tuesday morning you're like Ugh, need more coffee but could anybody answer this question? It's kind of, I'm going to phrase it in an interesting way. Um, when I do the bromination here, would I end up with one stereocenter or two stereocenters in my product? Right here, I only ended up with one. But in this second example, will I get one stereocenter or two stereocenters? And if you have to draw it out, no big deal. All right, so yeah, we get some we get some votes here. So let's let's draw what we get, and let's see if we can make a decision based off of that. So let's start by drawing one of the products. So I'm going to start by just drawing the carbon skeleton, so like this. I'm going to draw this bromine is going up, or sorry, down. I'm going to draw this bromine is coming up. So that would mean that the methyl group is going to be going down like that. Now. Could anybody tell me how many stereocenters are in this molecule? The answer is there's two, aren't there? Right? I have a stereocenter here and a stereocenter there. Two stereocenters. So that means I have an enantiomer. Let's draw it out. Okay, I have an enantiomer. We have the methyl group going up. I have the bromine going back. And I have this bromine coming up like this. All right, there we go. So in both cases, we get a pair of enantiomers. So these are enantiomers, enantiomers, and the same thing here. These are enantiomers as well, enantiomers. All right, so again, we ended up with only one stereocenter in the first um, halogenation reaction, and we ended up with two stereocenters in the second one. I guess maybe one of, a, maybe a quick way to remember this is if you have a methylene, right? If you have a CH2, and you add a bromine, it's not going to be a stereocenter by definition. It's impossible. All right. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on that. Or if you have a question, feel free to stop me. If you're unsure about something. And again, like I always say, if you can't think of a question now and you have a question, you know, this afternoon, you're like, oh, I, you know, I had a question. Feel free to email me at any time. All right. Great. Cool. Yeah, it's kind of a cool reaction. Well, if you look at the conditions for these two reactions, you notice that it's just bromine. There's like nothing else there. I mean, 
that's kind of true and kind of not. Okay, I mean, bromine is the reactant. However, there must be a solvent. I'll just tell you the truth, you know. Usually this kind of reaction is done in a chlorinated solvent like dichloromethane. It's never really brought up in the textbook a whole lot, but that's normally a solvent that we would use to do a chlorination or maybe something like chloroform. I mean, we're trying to get away from chloroform these days or any kind of chlorinated solvent, but these are examples of solvents you might want to use for this. So now what we're going to do is we're going to look at a halohydrin formation. We're still in section 8.9. 8 but the reason I mentioned the solvent is because of this. If you try to do the same reaction, okay, what we saw so far is that you just take your reaction and you just put it in bromine, and then you have some kind of chlorinated solvent, maybe like dichloromethane. Well, in halohydrin formation, what's different is that you use bromine, but your solvent is water. Okay, it says right here. Halohydrins are formed when, halo, when a halogenation is conducted in water, okay? So instead of the bromide being your nucleophile, water will be your nucleophile, okay? So these would be the reaction conditions for halohydrin formation. Now, if you're wondering, you know, why would water be my nucleophile? Because when I make the bromonium ion, I already showed you this, and I'm just going to back up to, to prove it. You know, I don't want you thinking like, oh, I, I missed something. Because no, you probably didn't. Um, when we make the bromonium ion, we make bromide, don't we? Right? If you have bromide in there, well, then why wouldn't that be a nucleophile? Because bromide is actually a better nucleophile than water. Well, the answer is this, okay? Is that if water is your solvent, the answer is simply this. You have way more water molecules than you have bromide ions floating around. So it's just based off of the, po the probability is that if water is your solvent, you have almost an infinitely number, you know, you know, you just have a, so much more water that water is going to be the nucleophile and that's it. Okay. So what happens is you have your bromonium ion, which is a, a fantastic electrophile. I mean, you've got a positive charge on it for Pete's sake. I mean, it's, it's ready to get attacked. So that's why water can attack it. And water is going to attack from the opposite face of the molecule, isn't it? Right, because this is the unhindered face. So water comes in, you end up with an oxonium ion, and then a water molecule is just going to come in. And I probably have this on the next slide, but another water molecule is going to come in and rip that proton off. Okay, and that's it, my friend. That's the mechanism. Okay, and you end up with a bromine on one face of the molecule and a hydroxyl on the other face of the molecule. So what I was first explaining on this slide is kind of summarized here. There's just many more water molecules compared to, I don't know what this is. That should just say bromide. I don't know why there's a number one there, but anyhow. So water outcompetes bromide for the bromonium. That's all there is to it, okay? So here's the whole mechanism. Again, I expect you to know this mechanism. So again, first step is the bromonium ion formation. The first part of the mechanism is identical to what we saw for the halogenation, right? Just the formation of the bromonium ion. You get a nucleophilic attack by water. Again, it attacks on the opposite face of the molecule. So you end up with anti-addition, all right? And you're going to end up with the bromine on one face, the hydroxyl on the other face, and you end up with the enantiomer. You know, if you have a bromine and a hydroxyl on the same molecule, this is called a bromo. A bromohydrin is kind of a funny word, you know, bromohydrin. And if you're wondering, you know, you told me at the beginning of the lecture, Mr. Dion, that uh, we could do the same types of things with chlorine, and it, it's absolutely true, right? You could use chlorine in water, and you end up with a chlorohydrin. So this is called a chlorohydrin. All right, bromohydrin and a chlorohydrin. And if you're annoyed with the whole bromohydrin and chlorohydrin and wondering, you know, what can I use these for? Well, I showed you, I think I showed you, how you could use it to make an epoxide last class. It was one of the questions that we looked at in chapter seven. Um, but uh, we're, we'll talk even more about bromohydrins and chlorohydrins later on and how they can be used in organic synthesis. So, you know, again, sort of um, moving on with the halohydrin formation, I have another question for you, you know, that I'm gonna answer, okay? Um, Every alkene that we've been looking at so far is symmetrical, right? Cyclopentene has a plane of symmetry. So in terms of where is the water going to attack? You know, both of these carbons that I have highlighted in yellow here, there's no difference between these. So it could attack either one, no big deal, okay? Well, what if you have an unsymmetrical alkene? 
right? What if you have this alkene here? What happens then? Because when you form your bromonium ion, you know, and I could draw the bromonium ion for you. So you're going to have your carbon carbon. Okay, you're going to have a bromine up here. The bromine has two lone pairs, right? And then you've got one methyl group going in the back and one coming out in front here, right? So this is after the bromonium ion is formed. So when you have your water molecule, right, the question is, is it going to attack here at this carbon, the more hindered carbon, or will it attack at the less hindered carbon? Well, you can see that the answer based off of this is that the hydroxyl, the water is gonna attack the more substituted carbon. I know you're like, this goes against everything I've learned, you know? Whatever happened to sterics, you know, and it's, it's too hindered. Why would it attack there? Well, there's a good answer, like everything in organic chemistry, okay? So it's going to attack there. You do your nucleophilic attack, your loss of leaving group, then a proton transfer, of course, after that. And yet you'd end up with your bromyl hydrin, your halo hydrin. Well, again, if you're kind of annoyed and you're just like, why would it attack a more hindered carbon? Everything you always say, you know, it's going to go to the least hindered phase. You know, what, what's the exception here? What's so great about this one here? Well, let me explain it to you, okay? Let me just explain why we uh, attack at the more hindered carbon. So I have it kind of explained right here. It says that regioselectivity, and I'm just reading directly from the slide. The regioselectivity results from the water, again, attacking the more substituted carbon, and it reacts faster um, than if it attacks the less substituted one, okay? And the reason why is because of a partial positive charge, okay? So here's just the mechanism shown with that un um, asymmetrical alkene, okay? You form your bromonium ion, and I drew that on the last slide, and then I showed you, well, the water comes in and it attacks the more hindered carbon. You do your proton transfer, and there you go. There's your bromohydrin. Well, here's the explanation, okay? It's because if you think of these two carbons, I'm gonna highlight them, this one in yellow and this one in green. If you think of those two carbon atoms there, during the transition state that occurs when the nucleophilic attack occurs, um, the positive charge has to pass through a carbon during that transition state. And it can pass through either one, right? So in other way, sorry, in other words, the transition state, what I have shown here for the transition state, um, has a partial carbocationic character. You can see that this is kind of a partial carbocation right here that I'm highlighting in yellow, right? But then which one of these carbons, the one in yellow or the one in green, is going to be more capable of stabilizing positive charge in that transition state? It's the one that's in yellow because we know that a tertiary carbocation would be more stable than a primary carbocation, let's say. So the more substituted carbon is going to be the one that's going to be more comfortable or more stable um, with that partial carbocationic character in the transition state. And that is why the water molecule attacks the more hindered carbon. Okay. Again, it's one of those things that I'll never ask you to write an essay. I'm never going to be like, okay, write me a paragraph about why water attacks the more hindered carbon. No. I won't do that, but I want you to understand the why, right? Because if you think about, and I've told you this before, I know I'm repeating myself, but it bears repetition. You think about any class you've ever taken. I know if I was to ask everybody here and say, have you taken a class at one point that you really enjoyed? Obviously you would all answer yes. Okay, you wouldn't be taking a 3000 level chemistry class unless you enjoyed something along the way, right? So if you think about a class that you really enjoyed, it's always gonna be something that you understand right, that you understand the why and the how. So this is just an explanation as to why the water is going to attack the more substituted carbon, because again, it would be more stable with that, oops, I didn't mean to erase it. It's gonna be more stable with that partial positive charge. And our book goes into no more detail than that. That is the explanation we're given. All right, so with all that in mind, Let's take a look and let's see what would happen if we were to treat these alkenes. I don't know why they didn't put reaction arrows on this one. So we're treating them with bromine and water, the first one, and the second one, bromine and water. I'm not going to draw a mechanism for this. You can practice doing that. But remember that what we're going to get is that the bromine is going to be going up, the hydroxyl is going to be going down, or the bromine is going to be going down, the hydroxyl is going to be going up. 
And based on these two carbons, right? Let's, let me ask you guys a question. If I highlight this one in green and this one in red, could anybody tell me which carbon the hydroxyl is going to end up on based on what I just told you? Would it be on the green one or the red one? And it's not trying to fool you or anything. Which one of these carbons is more substituted? Yep, absolutely, absolutely. All of my students are 100% correct, right? The hydroxyl is gonna end up on the green carbon. It's more substituted. So if that, if I have a battle between the green carbon and the red carbon, which one is gonna be more comfortable with partial carbocationic character? The one that's in green because it's more substituted. There you have it, that's all there is to it. So let's draw what we'd get. We're gonna get a compound where we have, oops, that's kind of ugly. There we go, that's an improvement. So let's draw our carbon skeleton. We're gonna have the hydroxyl pointing up. Then I'm gonna draw the bromine pointing down. Yes, I know it's not a stereo sensor. I'll fix that later. And then we're also gonna end up with this compound where we have the hydroxyl going down and the bromine going up. And that's it, my friend. That's all there is to it. As we say in French, that's it, that's all. Now, again, I know that these two carbons are not stereo sensors. So there's no need of drawing a dash or a wedge to the bromine, it's not important. But again, if you're doing that while you're practicing, you're just, you know, you're like, I'm learning the subject, give me a break, yeah, no problem, no problem. But I'm gonna erase it, because I'm the instructor. So I'm gonna erase those, and I'm just gonna use just a regular sigma bond here. And there you go. So what's the relationship between these two compounds? It's a pair of enantiomers, right? There's one stereocenter. So here we go, enantiomers. In the next one, again, uh, I'm going to ask you the same question. I know you're probably tired of me asking you questions that you know the answer to already. But if I have the yellow carbon and the blue carbon, which one of these is going to take the hydroxyl? Which one will it have the bond to the oxygen on it? Would it be the yellow one or the blue one? Absolutely. Yes. There you guys. Thanks, Warren. Perfect. Absolutely. 100% correct. All right. There we go. So let's start by drawing. The carbon skeleton, I'll draw, first I'll start with the hydroxyl going up and the bromine going down. And so that means this methyl group would be going down. And then if you just wanna write, if you're just fast and you wanna write plus an antimer, there's no problem with that, okay? If you don't wanna do that and you wanna write out full structure, which I like to do some of the time, we'll say, we'll go like this, the hydroxyl's going down and then the bromine is coming up like that and there's your bromohydrin all right absolutely all my students are answering questions 100 percent correctly all right i love a reaction that's got a good explanation you know i like any reaction that's got a, a well understood explanation and i'm here to tell you that not every reaction in organic chemistry has a mechanism that uh, is completely understood you know uh, what you'll see is that as we progress through the class, there's several mechanisms where I'll say, well, you know, there's some partial understanding of this, or you don't have to know the mechanism. It's not all that well understood. In fact, Dr. Diaz and I have a book in our office, and I'm not kidding. The title of the book is called The Art, okay, so A-R-T, The Art of Drawing Reasonable Mechanisms in Organic Chemistry. So, you know, it, we, you kind of laugh at the title. You're, you're saying, is this science? You know, it's just, it's an art. It's an art of drawing something that's reasonable. It's not even saying it has to be 100% correct. It's just got to be reasonable. And that's something that, you know, when I was in, um, when I was working in pharm the pharmaceutical industry, whenever I did a job interview, and I did quite a few of them, uh, you know, they would ask you a mechanism that they didn't even understand. They would always ask you questions, not all of them, but they'd always ask you a mechanism that they didn't know the answer to. And they'd, they wouldn't tell you that, but they'd say, what do you think the answer is? You know, and after 20 minutes of struggling on the chalkboard, you'd say, well, what is the answer? And they'd say, oh, we don't know. You know, we just wanted to see what you would say. <laughs> Anyhow, kind of funny there. All right, so let's move on. Now we're in section 8.10. This deals with anti-dihydroxylation. If you look at the, the chapter, chapter eight in our textbook, what you'll see is that chapter or section 8.11 deals with syn dihydroxylation. So we talk a lot about dihydroxylation, which actually makes me think of another job interview that I was in at Merck Frost. I don't know if any of you have heard of the Merck company, 
but I did a job interview at Merck Frost. I actually did two job interviews there. But anyhow, one of the job interviews that I went to, first question they asked me were like, Mr. Dion, how many ways do you know how to do dihydroxylation? I said, well, this way and that way. We probably talked about that for a half an hour. Anyhow, so dihydroxylation is a really useful reaction in organic chemistry. We'll talk more and more about why throughout the class, but all we do is we take an alkene. So just start out with a regular alkene. Here we're starting with the simplest possible alkene and we're adding two hydroxyls. Now here we're making ethylene glycol. Does anybody know where you would find ethylene glycol in your everyday life? I think I might have mentioned it earlier on when we were talking about, um, you know, propylene and ethylene and what you can do with those. Does anybody know where you would find? Yeah, absolutely, Warren, 100 percent. Yeah. The other day I was in the parking lot at Lowe's and I saw somebody pouring water into their radiator, which you can do at this time of year because it's so hot. But anyhow, ethylene glycol. Yeah, there we go. So um, anti-dihydroxylation is a two reaction process. So the first step is to take your alkene and treat it with a peroxy acid. So this is a peroxy, peroxy acid. And there's two specific peroxy acids that we'll look at. When we have an R group, that just means a gen generic peroxy acid. You should know the Lewis structure of RCO3H. So it's kind of like a carboxylic acid. You just have an extra oxygen in there. So that's the Lewis structure of the peroxy acid. The mechanism is going to be on the next slide. Anyhow. You take that and you make an epoxide. Since that three-membered ring is so small, both of the bonds to the oxygen are going to be on the same face of the molecule. <clears throat> and then what happens is an epoxide is really strained too, right? That's a three-membered ring. That's ready to open. It's going to want to open up too. And so when you treat that with aqueous acid, again, it kind of po pops open like a jack-in-the-box, and we end up with a trans diol. And there's a good reason why you end up with trans instead of uh, the cis diol. And let's take a look at the mechanism that helps us under, understand why this all happens. So this first mechanism here, this, this concerted mechanism, concerted is just a fancy word in organic chemistry that means everything happens at once. Um, you do not need to know this mechanism, okay, for the formation of the epoxide. It's just, a, I mean, come on, it's a, it's a one-step mechanism. It's four arrows. If you want to memorize it, be my guest. There's no problem with that. But uh, again, it's one I won't ask you to memorize. But check it, check it out. Basically, what you do is you end up taking this oxygen, and that's the one that you make the three-membered ring, the epoxide with, and then you're left over with a carboxylic acid in the end. So in terms of peroxy acids, there's two peroxy acids that show up a lot in this textbook. One of them is peroxyacetic acid, right? If you have acetic acid, which is the acid found in vinegar, that's this. So you throw an extra oxygen in there and you get peroxyacetic acid, okay? Another one that's really common is this one here, MCPBA. That's the acronym we use, okay? Which is metachloroperoxybenzoic acid. I usually just call it metachloroperbenzoic acid, which is acceptable too. But anyhow, MCPBA, the reason, if you're like, that's a pretty funny looking molecule, like why is that so special, right? Why is that used so much? The reason why is it works really well, number one, and number two, it's a solid at room temperature. So it's really easy to work with. Anyhow, so MCPBA works really well. In fact, when I was in graduate school, I had a, uh, an instructor who I took a class with, and it seems like he was obsessed with that molecule. He started everything with with that molecule. Anyhow, um, now what about the whole um, idea of the anti-dihydroxylation? Why is it anti-dihydroxylation? Well, look, if we were to take, if we were to draw this molecule that I had on the previous slide, and just bear with me here for a second, right? If both of these bonds to the oxygen are going up, then this would be the Haworth projection. Right. So what happens first, in order to render the three membered ring, the epoxide, more susceptible to nucleophilic attack, you protonate the oxygen. Now you can imagine it's electrophilic like crazy. And now water is going to come in and where is it going to attack? Well, we saw this when we looked at the bromonium ion and whether it was dibromination or, or sorry, bromination, chlorination or a halo hydrogen formation that the nucleophile is going to attack where the less hindered face of the molecule. And that's why you end up with anti-addition, 
okay, anti-dihydroxylation, which results in a trans diol. So we call this a trans diol. And we've learned about cis and trans. This is a trans diol, right? One hydroxyl is on one face of the molecule and the other one's on the other face of the molecule. You gotta remember that this step here, okay? That proton transfer, right? The reason why you protonate that epoxide is it makes it so electrophilic, right? Because water is not a great nucleophile. You remember that from chapter seven. We said water is actually a weak nucleophile, but once you make something so electrophilic, water is gonna attack no problem. It attacks from the opposite face of the molecule and we get the trans diol. So overall, the whole reaction, which I don't know why it's not written on here, but if you were to take, let me see, if you were to take cyclohexene, for example, okay, so this is cyclohexene. The way the whole thing works is first you would treat it with your peroxy acid, okay, peroxyacetic acid or MCPBA. And then in the second step, you treat it with water and then, or sorry, aqueous acid. And then what you end up with is the transdiol. Okay, you end up with the transdiol plus you end up with the enantiomer. Okay, so this is the overall reaction sequence. It's not really introduced until we get to the practice problems, but this is the overall sequence. So first step is treatment with um, a peroxy acid to make the epoxide. And then in the second step, you blow it open with acid, right? Boom, all right. So that covers all of section 8.10. It's not a long section, it's actually a really short section. Now I want to talk to you about syn dihydroxylation, and then we'll take a look at some um, practice in a few minutes. But I want to cover the whole concept of syn dihydroxylation. First, I want to talk to you about something kind of funny, okay? Um, there's a blog that I follow, which is a medicinal chemistry blog, but the guy who writes it is an organic chemist by trade, and he's a really good organic chemist. And um, in this blog, I think it's probably the most famous blog for organic chemists. I could send you a link if you want to read it or whatever. But anyhow, he had he wrote a blog post last year or maybe a couple years ago and it was called Stuff I Won't Work With. Okay? Stuff. A good chemist should never use the word stuff, huh? Stuff I won't I won't work with. So the guy worked as a chemist in a company and he said, I have a short list and most chemists have a short list of things they don't want to touch because they're either afraid they're going to get hurt or, you know, they're going to get, um, you know, they're, it's going to mutate their DNA. Like one of my friends used to say, chemist to chemist, there's two types of chemicals, ones that can mess you up and ones that can mess your children up. Now, I know that sounds a little crude, but I understand what the guy meant. And one of the things, and my short list does not include this compound because I've worked with osmium tetroxide many times. But I worked with somebody in Canada, and something that was on their list was this compound, OSO4. It's called osmium tetroxide. Okay, so this is osmium. When was the last time you thought about osmium, right? Osmium tetroxide. Okay, it is a very toxic compound. It even says it down here. It says osmium tetroxide, it's expensive and toxic, okay? So it's a dangerous compound. Again, I've used it. I used it even in graduate school before I was all that experienced. But, um, you know, it's on some people's list of things that they won't work with. So we're going to talk about osmium tetroxide for a few minutes here. If you want to add two hydroxyl groups to the same face of the molecule, probably the oldest, maybe not the oldest, but one of the most well-known ways to do this is to use osmium tetroxide, okay? You take your alkene, you treat it with osmium tetroxide. This is the Lewis structure of it right here. And you make this thing called the cyclic osmate ester. I'm never going to ask you to draw that, okay? I'm not going to ask you to draw these curved arrows either. But then you take the cyclic osmate ester and you treat it with either sodium sulfite in water or sodium bisulfite in water, right? A little practice of your inorganic chemistry nomenclature, right? Your gen chem, right? You remember SO3, SO3, 2 minus, that's sulfite, right? SO4, 2 minus, that's sulfate. Anyhow, so overall, this is a two-step process. The first step is to treat the molecule with OSO4, osmium tetroxide, and the second step is to either to treat it with sodium uh, sulfate, sorry, <laughs> sodium sulfite in water or 
sodium bisulfite in water, okay? In water. All right, the, the, the problem, and, and, and I'm using the word problem loosely here, but the issue with this reaction, if you do it this way, is that you have to use a stoichiometric amount of osmium. Okay, of the osmium tetroxide. So that means if you had one mole of this, you'd have to use one mole of this. Okay, so that means you're dealing with a lot of osmium. And so what it says here at the bottom is it says osmium is expensive, it's very dangerous. Conditions have been developed where the osmium tetroxide is regenerated. So only catalytic amounts are needed. Now, if, if it's a catalyst, that means it gets recycled over and over and over. So that would mean if you say used one mole of this instead of using one mole, right, you could greatly diminish it. Maybe you could get away with 0.1 mole, or maybe you could even get away with 0 0.05 moles, right? You could just use five mole percent. Okay, you could use a lot less of it, right? And when you're using something that's dangerous, you don't want to use a lot of it. You want to use as little as possible. And so after I pontificated to you about how I have used osmium tetroxide in the past, the only time that this guy has ever used it was in a catalytic amount, okay? So I only used maybe one or two drops, you know, and put double gloves on my hands and everything. But the way that we use it when we use it in a catalytic process is we use the osmium tetroxide, and then we use this compound here called NMO. So NMO stands for, let me write it down here. NMO, NMO is N-methyl, Morpholine, morpholine, and oxide. I'm kind of running out of space here. And oxide. This is a functional group that is never covered in organic chemistry one or organic chemistry two for non-chemistry majors. It's kind of a funny one. This is called an N oxide. That's that's an actual functional group. Okay. Now again, we don't cover it, but that's what it is. That's where that comes from. If you're wondering, like that's kind of strange. Yeah, it's called an N oxide. Um, so you can get away with a catalytic amount of osmium tetroxide, NMO, and you get syn dihydroxylation. Instead of using NMO, which is called a co-oxidant, it basically helps to recycle the osmium tetroxide, you can also use this. This is tert butyl hydroperoxide. I can scribble that down for you too. And again, this is in your textbook, but this is called tert butyl hydroperoxide. I ran out of space there. Okay. Now, another option is to use um, potassium permanganate in cold sodium hydroxide. So that is probably the oldest known method to do um, a dihydroxylation. So let's put that in too. I'm going to throw that in here. So I'm just going to draw another arrow and you write KMNO4, sodium hydroxide, and cold. That just means you do it at like maybe zero degrees Celsius or something like that. Now, if you're really astute, you might be saying, well, hold on, Mr. Dion. Like, I used potassium permanganate in general chemistry one, you know, in the, it's pretty harmless, you know. Um, maybe you used it for a, a type of titration, maybe in, in Gen Chem 2 or something like that. And it is pretty harmless. However, the problem with this, with using potassium permanganate and sodium hydroxide, it is it has a habit of oxidizing everything okay so if you have anything else in the molecule that might be susceptible to oxidation it can make a mess so that's why we have other ways of doing it so we've got those three methods and then the last one is the first one that we looked at which again was to treat it first with osmium tetroxide and then in the second step was to use sodium sulfite in water or so it's kind of like a total of five ways or sodium bisulfite in water. All right, so dihydroxylation. Again, no mechanisms for this section. There's no mechanisms. The closest thing to a mechanism are these three arrows here, and I won't ask you to draw those. All right, so we got syn dihydroxylation, and we've got anti dihydroxylation. I don't know why I put syn, uh, it should say syn and anti dihydroxylation as the title here, because I tried to squeeze a whole bunch of problems in here. All right, let's take a look at 8.24. Again, come comes straight out of your textbook. It says, predict the products that are expected when the following alkene is treated with a peroxy acid like MCPBA, metachloral per benzoic acid, followed by aqueous acid. So what's it saying? You're taking this alkene, which is 1,2-dimethylcyclopentene. First step, we're treating it with MCP. 
BA, which is the same thing again as RCO3H. It's just a peroxy acid. And then in the second step, we treat it with H3O plus, right? Well, what happens when we treat it with the MCPBA is that we make an epoxide, don't we? Right, we make an epoxide that is gonna look like this. I'm gonna draw it where I have both of the bonds going up. So that would mean that the two methyl groups are gonna be pointing down like this. So that's what we get after the first step. And then after the second step, when we treat it with acid, aqueous acid, we're going to pop that ring open. The epoxide gets popped open, and we're going to end up with something that looks like this. And again, um, the water could attack at either one of these carbons here. It's, it's symmetrical. And so we're going to end up with having the hydroxyl up and this one down. So the methyl group here would be up, and the methyl group here would be down. And then we're also going to end up with the enantiomer, right? We end up with a trans diol plus it's an enantiomer. There you go. If we look at section or question rather 8.27, predict the products. Um, osmium tetroxide, catalytic amount of osmium tetroxide and NMO, which is our co-oxidant. Again, co-oxidant is just a tatsy word for um, a molecule that's going to recycle the osmium tetroxide basically regenerates it over and over and over. Well, this is going to result in syn dihydroxylation, right? The first one was anti dihydroxylation. Now we're going to get syn dihydroxylation. So let's draw what that looks like. You end up with one hydroxyl pointing up and the other hydroxyl. Now that's not a very pretty. There we go. And the other one like this. Okay, so we're going to end up with this plus the enantiomer. Now, if you look at this, it might be a knee-jerk reaction to think that that's a meso compound something, but, or something, but that is not a meso compound by any stretch of the means. There is no plane of symmetry here. Okay, All right. If you rotate this carbon-carbon bond, what you see is that this is the same thing as. Uh, I can do a little better than that. There we go. It's the same thing as this, okay? So it's very clear that there's going to be a non-superimposable mirror image to this, right? There's going to be an enantiomer, all right? Here we go. And then the last one is we're taking the alkene, we're treating it with um, potassium permanganate and sodium hydroxide at cold temperature. Again, it's another syn dihydroxylation. This one's a little bit easier to write down. I have a question for you guys, and you can probably guess what my question is. Will I have an enantiomer in this case? Yes or no? Would this compound have an enantiomer? I know you know the answer. Yeah, the answer is no. I see that all my students are answering it correctly. Why not? I want a one-word answer. Can you give me the fastest possible answer? Exactly. You're both 100% correct. Yep. There's no enantiomer because this is a meso compound. Yes, absolutely. There you go. You end up with a meso compound in that case. It's kind of cool how we tie in chapter five so much in organic chemistry. Uh, you know, you think about things that you learn at the beginning of the class and then they come up every day in organic chemistry. Stereochemistry is one of those things that after you learn it, it just never goes away. It's just always there. It pops up almost every day. Organic, well, who am I kidding? Every day it pops up in something that you're going to learn in this class or in organic chemistry too. So something to, something to think about there. All right. Well, the last new reaction, I know you're probably a little bit eager for a break, as am I. I just want to introduce you to this last reaction. Why? Because there's no mechanism that you need to memorize in section 8.12, which deals with oxidative cleavage. Sometimes we call this ozonolysis because we use ozone, right? O3 is ozone, okay? Um, and there's a really cool skill builder. I don't refer to the skill builders a lot from our textbook, but there's a really cool one in the textbook that helps you understand um, or it helps you to draw the products here. So what happens, it says the carbon-carbon bonds are also reactive towards oxidative cleavage, and that's what we call this, oxidative cleavage, or I call it ozonolysis, okay? Because we're using ozone. So the first step 
is you take your alkene right here, you treat it with ozone in the first step, and then in the second step, you treat it with DMS, which is dimethyl sulfide. Okay, dimethyl sulfide. The structure of DMS is this. You guys know what a sulfide is because you learned it in the functional groups. Dimethyl sulfide is one of the stinkiest compounds going. It's so stinky. I'm not kidding. It's so foul. The odor is so foul at such small amounts that, and I could be wrong about this, but what I understand is that DMS is actually put in pipes in oil refineries and, you know, where they do cracking of, you know, gasoline and all this stuff so that if there's a leak, the human nose, I'm not kidding, the human being's nose can detect it very quickly, okay? More quickly than a sensor could. So DMS is really stinky. So if you ever have to do this reaction, you know, there's a way that you can avoid using DMS. I'll put it um, right here. So, or step two, you can also use zinc and water together, okay? Either way works. Um, again, so what happens is you actually end up breaking the double bond, it gets cleaved. That's why we call it cleavage, oxidative cleavage. And you just put an oxygen on the end of each double bond, okay? And that's what it shows you in the skill builder. Skill builder. Let me redraw the alkene and I'll kind of show you my interpretation of the skill builder, okay? So you draw the alkene like this, and I'm gonna use the pixel eraser. And then what you do is you literally take your pencil eraser you erase the double bond and then you put an oxygen on each end like that. And this compound is this one and this compound is that one. And that's how you draw the products. Nothing to it. Okay. Just like that. All right. Again, it's covered in the skill builder, which is probably even more clear than my representation there. Now, ozone exists as a resonance hybrid. It's got two resonance contributors to the overall resonance hybrid and it can add to the double bond i'm never going to ask you about this mechanism it says it here in big bold red letters but it is kind of cool to look at the first intermediate that you get is called a molozonide and then the molozonide undergoes a decomposition then it undergoes another reaction to give you what's called an ozonide and then you treat it with the reducing agent which again is either dms or zinc and water all right so again, it says here the common reducing agents are either DMS or zinc in water. And again, if you want to know exactly which skill builder I'm referring to, it's skill builder 8.8. It's a really simple way to predict the products, but hey, it works, you know, and you can't argue with success. So with all that in mind, let's take a look. It says predict the products that are expected when each of the following alkenes is treated with ozone, right? In the first step, it's a two-step process followed by DMS. Again, DMS is dimethyl sulfide. So CH3, sulfur, CH3. Okay. Now, again, I'll show you how that skill builder works. I'm just going to have to redraw the compound. Okay. Who was it that said Bigley? I don't remember. Was that President Trump? I don't remember. It might have been another politician. But anyhow, somebody said Bigley. So I'm going to draw the molecule Bigley. Anyhow, it's not a word, I know. All right, anyhow. So, again, this is a real hammer and tongs approach is what I call it. But, hey, it works. So, one way of drawing the products would be to literally do this. You would just start erasing the double bonds like this. And then you take your pen and you put an oxygen here, 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 and here. There you go. Now, if you answered that way on a quiz, you know, in the classroom, I'd be like, eh not in love with the way you, you know, the, the way these structures are drawn, but technically they're correct. So if you want to make it a little nicer, you would draw it maybe like this. So we have a carbonyl here. We have another carbonyl here. One, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, like this. So that would be a nicer way to draw the big one and then or the, the bigger molecule. And then this is called acetaldehyde. Okay, give me a thumbs up if you follow me on the strategy for drawing this. And if you have a question about it, feel free to fire away. Does everybody follow me on just the strategy, uh, the skill builder strategy of erasing the double bond? Okay, cool. All right, good. It's kind of cool, huh? Really, really helpful. Well, let's do the next one and we'll see if we can do it without drawing, you know, re redrawing the molecule. All right. 
There we go. So we do this. We're going to cleave this double bond here. <clears throat> this one might be a little bit trickier, right? If you cleave that, what would you end up with? I'll try to draw it in the 3D, you know, 3D confirmation um, to start with. So we end up with something that looks like this. And then we would have a carbon here, a carbon here. And then we've got a double bond to oxygen. See, I'm kind of running out of space here. Anyhow, you have two aldehydes that look like this. I mean, it's kind of an ugly way of drawing it, but what you're getting is this. You have a five-membered ring, right? This five-membered ring, okay, that I'm highlighting in yellow, it's this one here. One, two, three, four, five. There you go. So we have the five-membered ring. Excuse me. Oops, that's not what I meant. There we go. Okay, and then you've got your two aldehydes. We'll put them both pointing up like this. You could put them both pointing down, doesn't matter, because you end up with a meso compound. All right. And there we have it, my friends. That covers all the reactions that you need to know in Chapter 8, all of these different addition reactions, some really interesting reactions that we looked at in this chapter.